Chapter 1, Section 3. Is right libertarian theory scientific in nature? Usually, no. <clears throat> the scientific approach is inductive. Much of the right liber libertarian approach is deductive. The first draws generalizations from the data, and the second applies preconceived generalizations to the data. A completely deductive approach is pre-scientific, however, which is why many right libertarians can't legitimately claim to use a scientific method. Deduction does occur in science, but the generalizations are primarily based on other data, not a priori assumptions, and are checked against data to see if they're accurate. Anarchists tend to fall into the inductive camp, as Kropotkin put it. Precisely this natural scientific method applied to economic facts enables us to prove the so-called laws of middle-class sociology, including also their political economy, are not laws at all, but simply guesses or mere asser assertions which have never been verified at all. See Kropotkin's Revolutionary Pamphlets, page 153 for that quote. The idea that natural scientific methods can be applied to economic and social life is one that many right libertarians reject. Instead, they favor the deductive or pre-scientific approach. This, we must note, is not purely limited to Austrian economists. Many more mainstream capitalist economists also embrace the deduction over induction methodology. The tendency for right libertarianism to fall into dogmatism or a priori theorems, as they call it, and its implications can be best seen from the work of Ludwig von Mises and other economists from the right libertarian Austrian school. Of course, not all right libertarians necessarily subscribe to this approach. Rothbard, for one, did. But its use by so many leading lights of both schools of thoughts is significant and worthy of comment. And we are concentrating on methodology. It's not essential to discuss the starting assumptions. The assumptions, such as, to use Rothbard's words, the Austrians' fundamental axiom that individual human act, uh, sorry, fundamental axiom that individual human beings act may be correct, incorrect, or incomplete, but the method of using them advocated by von Mises ensures that such considerations are irrelevant. Von Mises, a leading member of the Austrian School of Economics, begins by noting that social and economic theory is not derived from experience. It is prior to experience, which is back to front. It's obvious that experience of capitalism is necessary to, in order to develop a viable theory about how it works. Without the experience, any theory is just a flight of fantasy. The actual specific theory we develop is therefore derived from experience, informed by it, and will have to get checked against reality to see if it's viable. <clears throat> this is the scientific method. Any theory must be checked against the facts. However von, v uh, however, von Mises goes on to argue at length that no kind of experience can ever force us to discard or modify a priori theorems. They are logically prior to it and cannot be proved or corroborative experience or disproved by experience to the contrary. And if this does not do justice to a full exposition of the phantasmagoria of von Mises's a prioriism, the reader may take some joy or horror, from the following statement. Quote, If a contradiction appears between a theory and experience, we must always assume that a condition presupposed by the theory was not present or else there is some error in our observation. The disagreement between the theory and the facts of experience frequently forces us to think through the problems of the theory again, but... So long as the th rethinking of the theory uncovers no errors in our thinking, we are not entitled to doubt its truth. This is Homa Kat uh, Katsoyan. Um, in other words, if reality is in conflict with your ideas, do not adjust your views because reality must be at fault. The scientific method would be... <laughs> Uh, would be to revise the theory in light of facts. It is not scientific to reject the facts in light of theory. This anti-scientific perspective is at the heart of his economics as experience, quote, can never prove or disprove any particular theorem. 
quote, what assigns economics to its peculiar and unique position in the orbit of pure knowledge and of the practical utilization of knowledge is the fact that its particular theorems are not open to any verification or falsification on the grounds of experience. The ultimate yardstick of an economic, economic theorem's correctness or incorrectness is solely reason unaided by experience. Von Mises rejects the scientific approach, as do all Austrian economists. Murray Rothbard states approvingly that Mises indeed held not only that economic theory does not need to be tested by historical fact, but also that it cannot be so tested. See Praxeology, the Methodology of Austrian Economics in The Foundation of Modern Austrian Economics, page 32. Similarly, von Hayek wrote that the economic theories, quote, can never be verified or falsified by reference to facts. All that we can and must verify is the presence of our assumptions in that particular case. Individualism, individualism and economic order, page 73. This may be seen somewhat strange to non-Austrians. How can we ignore reality when deciding whether a theory is a good one or not? If we cannot evaluate ideas, how can we consider them anything but dogma? The Austrians maintain that we cannot use historical evidence because every historical situation is unique. Thus, we cannot use complex heterogeneous th historical facts as, they were, uh, as if they were repeatable homogenous facts. Like those in a scientific experiment. Rothbard. While such a position does have an element of truth about it, the extreme a priorism that is drawn from this element is radically false, just as extreme empiricism is also false, but for entirely different reasons. Those who hold such a position ensure that their ideas cannot be evaluated beyond logical analysis. As Rothbard makes clear, since praxeology begins with a true axiom, A, all that can be deduced from this axiom must also be true. For if A implies B and A is true, then B must also be true. But such an approach makes the search for truth a game without rules. The Austrian economists and other right libertarians and thus pseudo-anarcho-capitalists who use this approach are free to theorize anything they want without such irritating constrictions as facts, statistics, data, history, or experimental confirmation, of course. Their only guide is logic. But this is no different from what religions do when they assert the logical existence of God. Theories ungrounded in fact and data are easily spun into any belief a person wants. Starting assumptions and trains of logic may contain inaccuracy so small as to be undetectable, yet will yield entirely false conclusions. In addition, trains of logic may miss things which are only brought to light by actual experience. After all, the human mind is not all-knowing or all-seeing. To ignore actual experience is to lose that input when evaluating a theory. Hence, our comments on the irrelevance of the assumptions used the methodology is such that incomplete or incorrect assumptions or steps cannot be identified in light of experience. This is because one way of discovering if a given chain of logic requires checking is to test its conclusions against available evidence, although von Mises did argue that the ultimate yardstick was solely reason unaided by experience. If we do take that experience into account and rethink a given theory in light of contradictory evidence, the problem remains that a given logical chain may be correct but incomplete or concentrate on or stress inappropriate factors. In other words, our logical deductions may be correct but our starting place or steps wrong as the facts are to be rejected in the light of the deductive method, we cannot revise our ideas. Indeed, this approach could result in discarding certain forms of human behavior as irrelevant, which the Austrian system claims uses, using empirical evidence does. 
for there are too many variables that can have an influence upon individual acts to yield conclusive results explaining human behavior. Indeed, the deductive approach may ignore as irrelevant certain human motiva motivations which have a decisive impact on an outcome. There could be a strong tendency to project right libertarian person onto the rest of society and history, for example, and draw inappropriate insights into the way human society works or has worked. This can be seen, for example, in an attempt to claim pre-capitalist societies as examples of so-called anarcho-capitalism in action. You see this regularly with these so-called ANCAPs making claims to market systems as capitalism. Moreover, deductive reasoning cannot indicate the relative significance of assumptions or theoretical factors. That requires empirical study. It could be that a factor considered important in the theory actually turns out to have little effect in practice, and so the derived axioms are so weak as to be seriously misleading. In such a purely ideal realm, Observation and experience are distrusted when not ignored, and instead theory becomes the lodestone. Given the bias of most theorists in this tradition, it is, it is unsurprising that this style of economic oh, Jesus it is unsurprising that this style of economics can always be trusted to produce results proving free markets to be the finest principle of social organization. And, as an added bonus, reality can be ignored as it is never pure enough according to the assumptions required by the theory. It could be argued because of this that many right libertarians insulate their theories from criticism by refusing to test them or acknowledge the results of such testing. Indeed, it could be argued that much of right libertarianism is more religion than a political theory as it's set up in such a way that it is either true or false, with this being uh, determined not by evaluating facts but by whether you accept the assumptions and logical chains presented with them. Strangely enough, while dismissing the testability of theories, many right libertarians, including Rothbard, do investigate historical situations and then claim them as examples of how well their ideas work in practice. But why does historical fact suddenly become useful when it can be used to bolster the right libertarian argument? Any such example is just as complex as any other, and the good results indicated may not be accountable to the assumptions and steps of the theory, but to other factors totally ignored by it. If economic or other theory is untestable, then no conclusions can be drawn from history, including claims for the superiority of laissez-faire capitalism. You cannot have it both ways, although we do doubt that right libertarians will stop using history as evidence that their ideas work. Perhaps the Austrian desire to investigate history is not so strange at all. Clashes with reality make a priori deductive systems implode as the falsifications run back up the deductive changes to shatter the structure built upon the original axioms. Thus, the desire to find some examples which prove their ideology must be tremendous. However, the deductive a priority methodology makes them unwilling to admit to being mistaken. Hence, their attempts to downplay examples which refute their dogmas. Thus, we have the desire for historical examples while at the same time they have extensive ideological justifications that ensure reality only enters their worldview when it agrees with them. In practice, the latter wins as real life refuses to be boxed into their dogmas and deductions. Of course, it is sometimes argued that it is complex data that is the problem. Let us assume that this is the case. It is argued that when dealing with the complex information, it is impossible to use aggregate data without first having more simple assumptions, i.e. that humans act. Due to the complexity of the situation, it is argued it is impossible to aggregate data because it, this hides the individual activities that it creates. Thus, complex data cannot be used to invalidate assumptions or theories. 
Hence, according to Austrians, the axioms derived from the simple facts that humans act are the only basis for thinking about the economy. Such a position is false in two ways. Firstly, the aggregation of data does allow us to understand complex systems. If we look at a chair, we cannot find out whether it is comfortable, its color, whether it is soft or hard by looking at the atoms that make it up. To suggest that you can is to imply the existence of green, soft, and comfortable atoms. Similarly with gases. They're composed to countless individual atoms, but scientists don't study them by looking at those atoms and their actions. Within systems, this is also valid for human action. For example, it would be crazy to maintain from historical data that interest rates will be a certain percentage a week, but it is valid to maintain that interest rates are known to be related to certain variables in certain ways, or that certain experiences will tend to result in certain forms of psychological damage. General tendencies and rules of thumb can be evolved from each study, and these can be used to guide current practice and theory. By aggregating data, you can produce valid information, rules of thumb, theories, and evidence, which would be lost if you concentrate on simple data such as humans act. Therefore, empirical study produces facts which vary across time and place, and yet underlying and important patterns can be generated, patterns which can be evaluated against new data and improved upon. Secondly, the simple actions themselves influence and are influenced in turn by overall complex facts. People act in different ways in different circumstances, something we can agree with Austrians about, although we refuse to take it to their extreme position of rejecting empirical evidence as such. To use simple acts to understand complex system means to miss the fact that these acts are not independent of their circumstances. For example, to claim that the capitalist market is just, the resultant of bilateral exchanges ignores the fact that the market activity shapes the nature and form of these bilateral exchanges. The simple data is dependent on the complex system, and so the complex system cannot be understood by looking at the simple actions in isolation. To do so would be to draw incomplete and misleading conclusions, and it is due to these interrelations that we argue that aggregate data should be used critically. This is particularly important when looking at capitalism, where the simple acts of exchange in the labor market are dependent upon and shaped by the circumstances outside these acts. So to claim that complex data cannot be used to evaluate a theory is false. Data can be useful when seeing whether a theory is confirmed by reality. This is the nature of the scientific method. You compare the results expected by your theory to the facts, and if they do not match, you check your facts and you check your theory. This may involve revising the assumptions, methodology, and theories you use if the evidence is such as to bring them into question. For example, if you claim that capitalism is based on freedom, but that the net result of capitalism is to produce relations of domination between people, then it would be valid to revise, for example, your definition of freedom rather than deny that domination restricts freedom. But if actual experience is to be distrusted when evaluating theory, we effectively place ideology above people. After all, how the ideology affects people in practice is irrelevant as experiences cannot be used to evaluate the logically sound but actually deeply flawed theory. Moreover, there is a slight arrogance in the Austrian dismissal of empirical evidence. If, as they argued, the economy is just too complex to allow us to generalize from experience, then how can one person comprehend it sufficiently to create an economic ideology as to the Austrians as the Austrians uh, suggest? Surely no one mind or series of minds can produce a model which accurately reflects such a complex system. To suggest that one can deduce a theory from an exceedingly complex social system, from the theoretical work based on an analysis technique which deliberately ignores that reality as being unreliable, seems to require a deliberate suspension of one's reasoning faculties. Of course, it may be argued that such a task is possible, given a small enough subset of economic activity. However, 
Such a process is sure to lead its practitioners astray as the subset is not independent of the whole and consequently can be influenced in ways the ideologist does not, indeed cannot, take into account. Simply put, even the greatest mind cannot comprehend the complexities of real life, and so empirical evidence needs to inform any theory seeking to describe and explain it. To reject it is simply to retreat into dogmatism and ideology, which is precisely what right-wing libertarians generally do. Ultimately, this dismissal of empirical evidence seems little more than self-serving. Its utility to the ideologist is obvious. It allows them to speculate to their heart's content, building models of the economy which bear an, uh, with, with no bearing to reality. Their models and the conclusions it generates need never be bothered with reality, nor the effects of their dogma, which shows its utility to the powerful. It allows them to spout comments like, the free market benefits all, while the rich get richer, and allows them to brush aside anyone who points out such troublesome facts. That this position is self-serving can, can be seen from the fact that most right libertarians are very selective about applying von Mises' argument. As a rule of thumb, it's only applied when the empirical evidence goes against capitalism. In such circumstances, the fact that the current system is not a free market will also be mentioned. However, if the evidence seems to bolster the case for propertarianism, then empirical evidence becomes all the rage. Remember, kids, that's not real capitalism. Needless to say, the fact that we do not have a free market will be conveniently forgotten. Depending on the needs of the moment, fundamental facts are dropped and retrieved to bolster their ideology. As we indicated in the previous section, and we'll discuss in more depth later, most of the leading right libertarian theorist base them, um, base themselves on such deductive methodology, starting from assumptions and logically drawing conclusions from them. The religious undertones of such methodology can be seen from the roots of right, a right libertarian natural law theory. Carol Pateman, in her analysis of liberal contract theory, indicates the religious nature of, of the natural law argument, so loved by the theorists of the radical right. She notes that for Locke, the main source of the libertarian right's natural law cult, natural law was equivalent of God's law, and that God's law exists eternally to and independently of individuals. If you would like to read more, you can read The Problem of Political Obligation, page 154 with Carol Bateman. No role for critical thought there, only obedience. Most modern-day natural law supporters forget to mention this religious undercurrent and instead talk about nature, or the market, as the deity that creates law, not God, in order to appear rational. So much for science. Such is a basis in dogma, and religion can hardly be a firm foundation for liberty and indeed natural law is marked by a deep authoritarianism. Locke's traditional view of natural law provided individuals with an external standard which they could recognize, but which they did not voluntarily choose to order their political life. In section 11, we'll discuss the authoritarian nature of natural law and will not do so here. However, here, we must point out the political conclusions Locke draws from his ideas. In Pateman's words, Locke believed that, quote, obedience lasts only as long as protection. His individuals are able to take action themselves to remedy their political lot. But this does not mean, as is often assumed, that Locke's theory gives direct support to present-day arguments for a right of civil disobedience. His theory allows for two alternatives. Either people go peacefully about their daily affairs under the protection of a liberal constitutional government, or they are in revolt against a government which has ceased to be liberal and has become arbitrary and tyrannical, so forfeiting its right to obedience. Locke's rebellion exists purely to reform a new liberal government. 
not to change the existing socioeconomic structure which the liberal government exists to protect. His theory, therefore, indicates the results of a priorism, namely a denial of any form of social dissent, which may change the natural law as defined by Locke. This perspective can be found in Rothbard, who lambasted the individual anarchists for arguing that juries should judge the law as well as the facts. For Rothbard, the law would be drawn up by jurists and lawyers, not ordinary people. The idea that those subjects to law should have a say in forming them is rejected in favor of elite rule. As von Mises put it, the flowering of human society depends on two factors, the intellectual power of outstanding men to conceive sound social and economic theories and the ability of these or other men to make these ideologies palatable to the majority. Yet, such a task would require massive propaganda work and would only ultimately succeed by removing the majority from any say in the running of society. Once that is done, then they have to believe that the ruling elite will be altruistic in the extreme and not abuse their position to create laws and processes which defended what they thought was legitimate property, property rights, and what constitutes aggression which ironically contradicts the key capitalist notion that people are driven by self-gain. The obvious conclusion from such argument is that any right libertarian regime would have to exclude change. If people can change the regime they're under, they may change it in ways that right libertarians do not support. The provision for ending amendments to the regime or the law would effectively ban most opposition groups or parties as, by definition, they could do nothing once in office for minimal state libertarians or in the market for defense agencies for, uh, for uh, so-called caps. How this differs from dictatorship is hard to say. After all, most dictatorships have parliamentary bodies, which have no power, but which can talk a lot. Perhaps the knowledge that, is, that it is a private police enforcing private power will make those subject to the regime maximize their utility by keeping quiet and not protesting. Given this, von Mises' praise for fascism in the 1920s may be less contradictory than it first appears, as it successfully deterred democracy by crushing the labor, socialist, and anarchist movements across the world. So, Mises, Hayek, and most right libertarians, and the so-called anarcho-capitalists that are descended from this, reject the scientific method in favor of ideological correctness. If the facts contradict your theory, then they can be dismissed as too complex or unique. Facts, however, should inform theory, and any theory's methodology should take this into account. To dismiss facts out of hand is to promote dogma. This is not to suggest that a theory should be modified every time new data comes along. That would be crazy, as unique situations do exist. Data can be both uh, can be wrong and so forth, but it does suggest that if your theory continually comes into conflict with reality, maybe it's time to rethink the theory and not assume that facts cannot invalidate it. A true libertarian would approach a contradiction between reality and theory by evaluating the facts available and changing the theory if this is required not by ignoring reality and dismissing it as complex. Thus, much of right libertarian theory is neither libertarian nor scientific. Much of right libertarian thought is highly axiomatic, being logically deduced from such starting axioms as self-ownership, or no one should initiate force against another. Hence the importance of our discussion of von Mises, as this indicates the dangers of this approach. Namely, the tendency to ignore and dismiss the consequences of these logical chains and indeed to justify them in terms of these axioms rather than from facts. In addition, the methodology used as such is that it would be fair to argue that right libertarians get to critique reality but reality can never be used to critique right libertarianism. For any empirical data presented as evidence is to be dismissed as too complex or unique and so irrelevant. 
unless it can be used to support their claims, of course. Hence, W. Duncan Rieke's argument, quoting leading Austrian economist Israel Kirzner, that empirical work has the function of establishing the applicability of particular theorems and thus illustrating their operation. Confirmation of theory is not possible because there is no constants in human action, nor is it necessary because theorems themselves describe relationships logically developed from hypothesized conditions. Failure of a logically derived axiom to fit the facts does not render it invalid. Rather, it might merely indicate inapplicability to the circumstances of the case. So if facts confirm your theory, your theory is right. If facts do not confirm your theory, it's still right, just not applicable in that case. Which has the handy side effect of ensuring that facts can only be used to support the ideology, never to refute it, which is, according to this perspective, impossible anyway. As Karl Popper argued, a theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. In other words... If reality contradicts your theory, ignore reality. Kropotkin hoped that those who believe in current economic doctrines will then themselves become convinced of their error as soon as they come to the necessity of verifying their quantitative deductions by quantitative investigations. However, the Austrian approach builds so many barriers to this that it's doubtful that that will ever occur. Indeed, right libertarianism, with its focus on exchange rather than its consequences, seems to be based upon justifying domination in terms of their deductions rather than analyzing what freedom actually means in terms of human existence. The real question is why, is why are such theories taken seriously and arouse such interest? Why are they not simply dismissed out of hand given their methodology and the authoritarian conclusions they produce? The answer is, at least in part, that feeble arguments can easily pass for convincing when they're on the same side as the prevailing sentiment and social system. And of course, there is the utility of such theories for ruling elites. An ideological defense of privileges, exploitation, and private power will be welcomed regardless of its merits. Noam Chomsky.